grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our risen and living Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The theme for our Lenten services this year is who gains from the cross and there's none whose gain is more obvious and expedient than that of Barabbas. Uh, who's the account of whom we read tonight in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 15 to 23. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? They all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. What can we say? The murderer, the rebellious, the sinful Barabbas is set free. And Jesus dies in his place. There is no more perfect earthly symbol of what Christ has done for us. Does Barabbas really get off scot-free just because Jesus was sent to die in his place? Yes, absolutely. He is released immediately without consequence, without judgment, without any kind of payment despite all the many horrendous and terrible things he has done. But what Barabbas gets from an earthly perspective, we get from a heavenly. That is the meaning of a parable. Earthly story with heavenly meaning. And the Bible makes it very clear that we receive spiritually the same thing that Barabbas received on this earth. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 19. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation passage describes very nicely for us what we call universal objective justification. Justification means the judge sits on his seat just like Pilate did and declares the judgment on the criminal. You are innocent. And once the judge has declared you innocent, free, not guilty, nothing else matters. You are free to go as Barabbas was universal, meaning that Christ has done it for the whole world, but also meaning that he has done it for all sin. God doesn't do things halfway. He doesn't go through a list of our life. Okay, I'll forgive this sin. I'll forgive this sin. No, nope, that one's too bad. He doesn't look at our sins individually. He simply looks at the fact that we're sinful people and he wipes it all away without payment or consequence. I tried to explain this once to a, a group of formerly Baptist, well, they really were Baptist, Baptist people in uh, Togo. And they just kept, they just couldn't accept it. They understood what I was saying, but they just couldn't believe that that really, that the forgiveness was just completely free without anything on their part. They just, they just kept raising their hand, but what about, what about, what about, but, but, but. There are no buts. There are no adversatives in God's declaration of forgiveness. 
It's all forgiven, universal and objective. And this was always my favorite adjective to try and explain or describe uh, overseas. Usually I'd have um, the translator. Often it was D. Paul in India, but in other places it was somebody else. Often I'd have the translator standing next to me. And so I'd, I'd just ask the people, OK, who is more handsome? And it was fun to do overseas because uh, since I'm white, I'm automatically more handsome than anyone. It's really easy to be handsome over there. You just have to be European or Caucasian. Um, here, I, I'm not going to do it here because probably you guys would pick the other guy. That's uh, an example of subjective, right? Everyone's going to say something different depending upon what you care about. If you know the thing you really care about is hair, then I'm not going to get the more handsome one. If the thing you care about is pale skin, then I get it. Well, overseas, I get it. That's a subjective, depending upon your own point of view. And then I'd say, OK, well, who is taller? And again, it's really easy to be the tall one in India. In Africa, not so much. But in India, it's really easy to be the tall one. But that was always obvious. And everyone would say the same thing. If I was standing next to Deep Paul, it, it would be me. It doesn't depend upon your point of view or anything within yourself. It's completely just dependent on the fact. And that's what we mean here. God's forgiveness is not dependent upon anything in ourselves. Jesus died for our sins. It happened. It's true. And that's the only thing that matters. And therefore, it's always true to all of us that our sins are forgiven. And so, too, Barabbas, in the same way, is justified. He's declared innocent. He's let go without any reference to anything in himself. It had nothing to do with him. He did not deserve it. But he receives it simply because Christ takes his place. The blood of Jesus sets him free, as it does us. The blood of Jesus always offers the forgiveness of sins. That's what it's there for. That's what Jesus came to do. But it does sometimes also condemn. And we see that in our account too, as it did for the crowd. They asked for the blood of Jesus to be upon them and upon their children, but not to receive the forgiveness of God. But to receive condemnation. Jesus warned about this very thing in the Gospel of John, in John 16, 8 to 9. He says, and when he has come, and Jesus there is speaking of the Holy Spirit. He says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, why? Because they do not believe in me. The rejection of Christ leaves only condemnation. If God had not revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ, then man may have an excuse. If God had not forgiven sins, if Jesus had not died on the cross for our sins, then again, man might have an excuse. But now, what excuse can you possibly give before the judgment seat of God. If you were to say to God, but how was I supposed to know you even existed? Then God will say, um, I sent my son. I became a man. I told you about myself. And in order to prove it, I rose from the dead. What more evidence do you want? So that excuse doesn't work. And if you were to say to the, to the throne of God on the day of judgment, if you were to say to him, but there's no way I, I can keep your law. I was, I, this is the way I was born. We tried to do what was right, but I couldn't do all the things you commanded. You made me this way. God will say, I know. That's why I sent my son to die for your sins and to give you forgiveness completely freely. But you didn't want the forgiveness. You rejected it. 
So then what, what excuse then is left? What else are you possibly going to say on that day of judgment? And why would you reject such a gift? Why would you say to Jesus, no, that's okay, I don't want your forgiveness? Well, Pilate was a coward. It was his job to correctly judge and put to death sinners and not righteous people. And knowing full well that Jesus was innocent, he sent him to death simply because the crowd insisted. So he was a coward. But he was not a fool. He knew full well why the Jews were rejecting Jesus and why so many people do nowadays too. For he knew, what does our text say? He knew that they delivered him up because of envy. Because of pride. The boy who gets straight A's in class is often not the most popular. Or if you work at a place and there's that one person who is just such a dedicated hard worker and kind of gets everything done and in comparison we realize how much we are not doing our jobs well we kind of get envious or jealous or ridicule them for some reason or another try and take them down a peg rather than simply admit our own failing Men often don't want the free gift of forgiveness through Jesus Christ for the simple reason that it means first admitting how terribly sinful we are. And so the Jews revel in the blood of Jesus, not in the forgiveness it offers them, but in the condemnation that they bring upon themselves. So, we are left with the two choices from our text today. We can join Barabbas, admitting that we are like him. That's the level of sinner we are, filled with pride, envy, rebelliousness, filled with hatred. And even if we don't actually act on that hatred, it's right there underneath the surface. So we can accept that's the level of person we are, Barabbases. And in that confession, rejoice in forgiveness of Christ's blood. Or we can take our stand with the Jews, insisting that we don't need a Savior. We are good enough in and of ourselves and then we are left only with the condemnation of Christ's blood. That's what Lent is all about. Remembering our sin and rejoicing in that forgiveness that Christ brings. Amen. We continue with the singing of the next hymn.